good, good morning, good day, good afternoon again. Like, I, mean, I don't know what time it is. I mean, oh, it's still, it's still morning, only just. Just about, yeah, and, uh, and, and we're in 2020, just in case you're wondering as well. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, my watch, my watch tells me it is, yeah. Sure. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I mean, Rachel and I were very fortunate to get a break last week. Uh, we, we had a, a five days at Centre Parks, uh, and that was good. Um, went on long walks, or rather short walks, to the Pancake House and back, so I guess that's one long walk. Uh, did a little bit of exercise, not too much, a lot of sleeping. Uh, we've been to centre parks before, actually, occasionally. Um, I didn't make the mistake this time that I've made in the past. I didn't go and walk into somebody else's villa straight in, as I had done in the past. Um, that was, uh, thankfully, the, the young couple were just sort of looking out of the window together at the time. Because uh, otherwise that could have been uh, perhaps uh, a little bit embarrassing. Uh, Did you leave unannounced as well? <laughs> uh, after, yeah, it took me a little while to work out that they weren't in my villa. And I was a bit annoyed about it because initially I thought that they were, you see. But actually I was in their villa. It actually took me a little while to work out, work that one out. <laughs> um, it was basically when I saw young children around that I realised that possibly I wasn't in my own villa. Uh, but um, so no, it was uh, it was a good place. So I've come back um, refreshed and raring to go back to Centre Park. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, and so this Sunday we're back in the church. We are. Um, you know that uh, I'm really really looking forward to it, and thanks for your help and involvement in, in, in sort of preparing the way. Uh, just to say that um, this Sunday I'm not going to be speaking from the Colossians. We're going to take a break for a week. I'm actually going to be speaking from Isaiah 65. Uh, where God says, uh, before you called, I answered. I'm going to have a look at that. Uh, and so we'll not have this midweek uh, chat on Colossians next week. We'll just take a bit of a break. And that will enable one or two home groups, actually, to sort of come up to speak with one or two home groups, because we've got a little bit behind. Uh, and there'll be some other changes as well. The service will be three quarters of an hour rather than an hour. Uh, we're mindful that uh, folk are coming in uh, wearing masks. Uh, and also to say that... Um, if you like, the book is now closed on those coming for this Sunday. Um, sure. Uh, and, uh, but those who have requested to come and, and, and are still able to come, because one or two folk have actually been ill, unfortunately, the last few days, but those who have requested to come and are still able to come on Sunday, we can accommodate them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're, we're starting with a smaller number, 30. It'll, it'll rise to 40 a week on Sunday, and then we're up to, up to 50. Just playing things cautiously and calmly, uh, and there will be some directions, and literally there'll be some arrows and, uh, as to show to, uh, for people to be clear as to where they go. Uh, and uh, I'll be fine. It'll be, it'll, it'll be really great. Uh, and, uh, and I'm longing to be able to stand up on a Sunday morning and say what I haven't been able to say for six months, and that is, could you please switch your phones to off or vibrate? You could, you could have been saying this all that, all that time. Well, I, I guess I could have been. We wouldn't have... Well, it wouldn't have had quite the same, if you'll excuse the pun, ring to it. Oof. You know, you know I, I worked that one out before you even said it. I knew well, it was coming. Well, yeah, so before I called, you answered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So we have um, we had your message on, on Sunday this week, um, mm -hmm. and we've read from Colossians, the, the next little bit, so from 5 to 15, or 6 to 15. Um, yes, once again, I'm not sticking rigidly to the chapter divisions as I did perhaps a little unwisely uh, with uh, Ephesians. Um, but Colossians 2, 6 through to 15, um, there's a huge amount in here. Uh, and uh, as, we, you know, uh, as I explored some of, it, some of it on Sunday, and hopefully we can explore um, some more of that in more detail and perhaps one or two kind of new things as well. So, um, yeah, Paul's writings are, are tremendously rich in depth. And breath, uh, and so just just trying to study it in slight, slightly more sort of manageable uh, chunks, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so the first bit we wanted to look at today, uh, from mainly verses six and seven. Yes. Uh, we're looking at how uh, Jesus Christ, we walk in Him, it's rooted in and built up in Him, and established our faith. So we're talking about that foundation. And so how are we rooted and built up in Jesus? Yes. I mean, verses six and seven are are actually the whole letter in microcosm. Uh, so what Paul is saying, and excuse the repetition here, but uh, well, I need the reminders, that um, we don't need Jesus and, we need more of Jesus. And we need to be deeply rooted in Jesus. Uh, and so if you like, well, you know, that's the theology, um, but how? How are we deeply rooted in Jesus? Well, uh, in fairness to Paul, um, he, actually gives the, he actually gives the answer. 
as, as well as the statement. Um, because amongst other things, he's saying that we need to continue to value teaching about Jesus. I sometimes do feel, to be honest, that um, Bible teaching uh, amongst the ministries of the local church, is. So, I think it's sometimes regarded as, as the Cinderella, quite frankly. Uh, and, uh, and it's the Cinderella that, um, you know, needs to be uh, able to go to the ball. Paul values biblical teaching. That is a key part of being deeply rooted uh, in uh, Christ. But there's something else as well, uh, and that is that we need to abound in thanksgiving, as the NRSV says, that we need to be a people who are thankful um, for everything that we have. You know, we need to be those who have uh, I think the cliche is, you know, um, the, the, the gratitude attitude. So we need to be people who value biblical teaching. I'm not sure that we always do. We need to. Uh, but as well as that, we need to be people who are a genuinely thankful people, that we're looking for ways in which we can thank God. We're proactive in that. I was at a, a Freedom in Christ course, a four-day course actually for leaders, and one of the things that we were challenged to do was to just go off by ourselves. And I thought, well, thanks very much for that. Let's just play part one of this course. So I just go on. Uh, but spend five minutes thanking God for anything and everything. Five minutes. And what um, they were challenging us to do was to learn as to actually how difficult that is. If that's not part of your ongoing persona. Uh, and I felt really quite humbled, actually, that, you know, by four minutes, 30 seconds, I was struggling to think of something to thank God for. I mean, I mean, how, how terrible is that? But I did actually find myself next to a, a coffee machine. Uh, uh, and, and so I thought, I'd, so I thanked God for the coffee machine. And then I felt that it was only appropriate that I actually had a cup of coffee from the machine so I could, you know, abound in my thankfulness to God even more for that cup of coffee. So uh, I, I did so that. So, so we need to be um, a thankful people. We need to value biblical teaching uh, and so that we can be deeply rooted in Jesus and not just go off, as I think, frankly, a number of churches are at the moment, not just go off into false teaching, superficial rubbish, uh, uh, and taking our attention away from being deeply rooted, foundational in Christ. I mean, you know, arguably the, the foundation is the most boring bit of the house. It's actually the most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I mean uh, past Bible study groups mm. or house home groups from my previous church, mm. we started every week mm. with with thankful marvels, and we would we would each get three to be thankful for from the week, All right. and we would take turns in putting them in the in the, in the jar. Oh, and right. that was how we started every single Bible study right. with our thankfulness. And a prayer to say thankful at the end. Oh, I, th I, I think I think it's a, a, a really good way. I think uh, for those of us who feel that perhaps we're losing our marbles in older age, that's something that you know, we need to. Uh, we, can, we can be thankful that we have some still left. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Are, are there any other ways in, in you know in your ministry with children and young people? Um, ha what other ways do you think that we, because it's not just Lords of Wales, that we as a church can help children and young people to get deeply rooted so that when they're older, they are continuing to plunge these roots down. Uh, have you got any sort of thoughts and uh, any insights on that? A, a child's or a children's first experience of love and Christ and faith all come initially from the family. Yes. And so the mother and father play that role, introducing that, to the young people, yes, uh, and so I'm not. I shouldn't necessarily, not always, be the first first point of call to all things spiritual or faith. No, um, I come in usually a little bit later on after they've got a few of the ideas, yes. and start just unpacking different parts of it because yes. we we get different sources of information, different sources of our foundation yes. from all different different parts. Yes, but church, mm -hmm. Sunday school, uh, youth groups mm. aren't normally the first point of call no. for young people sometimes we get teenagers that come with friends to youth groups yeah. and we will be their first point of call because yes. they're not coming from yeah. families that have yeah um and then that's okay as well mm. but for those who are coming with with families or mm. families that are involved in the church 
which the young usually the younger ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're not usually their first point of call. Yeah. Now this this does change actually again, pardon me, with uh, with Messy Church. Mm-hmm. We get some families that haven't really had an experience with with faith before, and they're coming sure. along because they want to try something new or see what it's all about. Yeah. And Messy Church is a is a great way of doing it. Same with Pebbles. Yeah. Um, the girls were great at doing some great work. Yes, they are. Um, but so a lot of these groups, although sometimes we are able to go deeper, mm. uh, it, it does still sometimes stay around foundations. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Well, I think Scripture is quite clear that um, for uh, for those parents who are believers, mm. uh, uh, and that um, the the primary responsibility for um, training up our children and young people rests with them. Uh, that our most important role uh, as Christian parents is to uh, model and to teach uh, and to model, because those two things uh, belong together, our children and young people. And your role as children and youth worker is secondary to that. Um, you know, I would, I would hope that a Christian parent d- it doesn't think that they can subcontract that responsibility to you. That's, that's not what it's about at all. And that, you know, brings a a very big challenge and a very big responsibility to to Christian parents. Good. (laughs) Let's own up to that value. Let's own up to that responsibility and let's own up to that challenge. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, when Jason, um, you know, would sometimes struggle with issues of theology and doctrine, um, he would go immediately to uh, to Rachel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what is important to to mention is... if you're not able to or willing to necessarily sometimes, I'm not accusing anyone or calling anyone out, but if you're not willing to teach your kids, mm. well, how are you supposed to evangelise to people that you don't know? People well, street, people indeed. that you work with, people that you're involved with in other ways yeah. that don't know Jesus yet. Yeah. I mean, kids are a great testing ground. <laughs> well, they are. Great, great practice. Yes, yes. And uh, and it's interesting, I mean, one can take that very helpful model um, at, at a sort of corporate and well international level because I know that Um, if you want to work with um, BMS World Mission, and if so, if you want to work as a missionary uh, abroad, um, BMS World Mission, and I'm assuming other missionary agencies as well, will look very closely as to whether you have been an effective missionary at home, within your family, and within your local community, uh, on the basis of that if you've not been a successful missionary at home, and in your home country, then you're not going to be a successful missionary abroad uh, and uh, well that's quite, a, it's quite an interesting side to it as well so the challenge that we all have to be deeply rooted in the faith uh, and to bring that challenge and that modelling to our children and young people uh, and that uh, valuing biblical teaching uh, and also to, to, be, to be looking for reasons to thank God and uh, not looking for reasons to complain and whinge looking for reasons uh, to be thankful uh, and um, you know, anyway, I'm struck by some of these things you know that if you've got spare change in your pocket um, which actually I, I, I do have I'll keep quiet about that <laughs> um, that that puts me in the wealthiest eight percent of the planet if you own your own home and I don't I don't commit that category but if you do you're in the wealthiest four percent of the planet. 96% of people in this country do not own their own home. So for many of us, we do actually have quite a lot to be thankful. If we're not being actively persecuted for our faith, we are fortunate. You know, if we haven't been thrown into prison with no hope of parole, uh, no hope for, you know, any response of justice further down the line, as, as is the case for millions of Christians, if that isn't our story, then we should be being thankful. Uh, and uh, so you know, there's, some, there's a chance there. Yeah, cool. We, I think we've, we've talked about that one for long enough. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, uh, indeed. Let's, um, let's move on to verse 10. Mm. Uh, we talk, we're looking at uh, to have been Christ or Jesus, who is the head of all rule and authority. Yeah. And so um, what does that mean as Christ being the head of all that kind of stuff? Well, I, th- I think it, it, it's precisely that, that uh, as Christians, we are aware of the fact that Christ is the head of the church. So the, the church belongs to Christ. Uh, he, is front, he is front and centre of that, and we get that. I think if we are Christian parents, we will understand that Christ is the head of the immediate home. 
um, um, when I was growing up, the, it, was, it would be quite popular to have these plaques which said, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. I mean, to be honest, it scared me witless. You didn't need CCTV in those days. You could just put one of those things up. I don't think that we're always aware, though, that Christ's headship goes beyond our immediate home, and it goes beyond the church, and that Christ is head over everything. Uh, and, uh, and I think sometimes we do need this reminder that there is nothing out there that Christ is not ruling over. Uh, and the reason why Paul very specifically uh, mentions, at least it does in the NRSV here, that he is a head over every ruler and authority is because at the time the temptation was to worship elemental spirits and local gods as well as Jesus. Uh, so it's just this kind of, you know, quite broad brushstroke point, really, that Christ is head over every aspect of our life. So it's beyond our home, it's beyond our church, it includes our mission field, it includes that, and, um, and that there must be no aspect of our life that we're splitting into the kind of sacred-secular divide. Christ is Lord of all. So um, let, let's remember that... Um, you know, somebody once, somebody once wrote that um, Christ is Lord of all or not at all. Uh, and so it's just remembering that Christ is head over everything and everyone, and Christ is ruling over this pandemic. He is in charge. Uh, and, and I think that should give us hope. I think that should give us confidence. Reasons to be thankful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's another, another marble to, to chuck in, isn't Indeed. it? Uh, uh, so to be sort of a, a, a grateful people, I, I, I'm bothered at the moment. Th I'm, I'm sensing a fair amount of fear amongst some Christians at the moment, to do with a pandemic and perhaps to do with some other things as well. You know, the uh, the impending very sharp rise uh, in, in unemployment. I'm not unsympathetic to those feelings of fear and uncertainty, but let's not lose sight of the fact that Christ is head over everything. And of course, um, come Judgment Day, it's not only the knees of Christians who will bow, every knee will bow, every knee. Uh, and in the Greek, that actually uh, refers to, you know, uh, lying prostrate, that is the word, by the way, prostrate uh, before Jesus. He is head uh, over all. The home, the immediate home, yes. Our church, absolutely. But everything else as well. And that should give us hope, it should give us confidence, uh, but there may be something of a challenge there as well. Are there areas of our life where Jesus is not ruling over because we are not allowing him to do so? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, another little change of angle now. So we're going to move up to verse 12. Mm. Uh, and again, Paul likes to mention baptism quite a lot. And so having been buried with him in baptism, yes. which you were also raised with him through faith mm -hmm. and the powerful working of God. Um, mm -hmm. So why, why again, is baptism important in this context here? Well, I, I think, to be honest, you, you, you've kind of given the answer there. Baptism is really important to Paul. He refers to it a lot. And he uses baptism to uh, explain a variety of things, uh, because baptism does. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, I'm really wanting to stress this, because I don't think I did, by the way, on, on Sunday last, but I think it is important for Christians to be baptised. I don't actually think it's an optional extra. Now, I know that there are uh, those Christians, and indeed there will be some watching this, who believe, in, uh, who believe that their infant baptism, or pido-baptism, as it's called, um, is their baptism. Uh, and I, I respect that position. I'm not dissing it. I, I, I note it. Um, but I do think that it is important that as Christians, we do develop a view about baptism uh, and that we follow that all the way through uh, and get baptised. I mean, when the Apostle Paul Peter was asked in, uh, in Acts uh, at the day of Pentecost, brothers, what shall we do? Um, Peter's response was, repent and be baptized now the order there is significant we need to repent first but then we do need to be baptized and um, 
What some people don't quite get when they're looking ahead at this baptism thing and they can't quite see the point of it, they can't quite see the necessity of it. Um, sometimes, with regard to baptism and with one or two other things as well, you only appreciate the something once you have been through it. You can't really appreciate it in advance. And actually, once you have been baptised, it becomes something of an anchor point in your life. It enables you to remain deep-rooted. That if after baptism you're going through a, a quite difficult time, and let's face it, after Jesus was baptised, he went into the wilderness and was tempted by uh, Satan. You can look back on that time when you were baptised and that can provide reassurance and hope and a greater understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Although I, I am to be buried with Christ, so all of my agendas, all of these things that I think are important, they have to die, they have to be buried, and I'm raised up with Christ to follow his agenda. And, you know, and, and being baptised, oh, I see now, that kind of reminds me of that. Uh, and so I, I think there is a challenge in the writings of Paul to take the, uh, the subject of uh, baptism really, uh, it, it should, it, we should regard that as, as really important. Now, I'm hoping there's going to be a baptismal service quite soon, actually, at Castle Hall. Are you aware that under the COVID regulations, the person has to baptise themselves? Really? No. No. No, I just, I just, 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 <laughs> just, no. I just winding you up at that point. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, that would be really weird. <laughs> it would be, yes. Uh, uh, no, but the minister or the person who's doing the baptising can't have anybody to assist them. Uh, that, uh, that is the regulation. So I, I'm hoping that we'll have a baptismal service at Castle Hall quite soon because the subject of baptism is truly important. And as I said, there are some Christians for whom they regard their infant or pied baptism as their baptism. I disagree with that, but I respect that view because that person has taken the subject of baptism seriously. They have thought about that, they have reflected upon that, and they have come to a view. Uh, and, uh, and part of um, the um, part of the, the culture of being a Baptist is that we respect those religious views within the context of the Christian faith, certainly, with which we may not agree. Religious liberty is, is a really important part of being Baptist. But um, hey, not, no great surprise that as Baptists we believe in... Now it's not infant, sorry, it's not adult baptism as opposed to infant baptism. It's believer's baptism as opposed to infant baptism. Uh, and so uh, I baptised uh, Jason when Jason was uh, uh, just 11. Uh, he had come to a place of faith. I'd taken him through the class, uh, and so I baptised him uh, at the age of 11. So, uh, um, yeah, so uh, I think that when he came up, you know, the water was actually still quite hot. He had to get a step. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, uh, a challenge here, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm labouring a point here. The challenge that all of us should take the subject of baptism seriously. Yeah, sure. Cool, so the next verse as well, mm -hmm. uh, into 13, mm. uh, and I'll just read it out. And, and you who were dead in your trespasses and, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses, and then into 14, mm. by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. So, what these, these together, what following the baptism, what do yes. these mean? Well, I think, that the, I think that the, that there are two things here. But Paul is stating that before we became Christians, uh, we were dead. Um, I, I find it quite ironic that there's such uh, there's been such an emphasis over this last decade within the film industry about zombie films. Uh, I, I don't actually like zombie films uh, very much at all. But there is an irony that they are depicting a society where the dead are walking. And that is precisely the society that we're in today. Um, I, I think in a, a, a culture which has been described, um, at least for some of us in the older generation were still there as being woke. Um, I've never come across a culture that is more dead at the moment. Uh, and so we need to understand that if we're not a believer in Christ, we're not thinking straight. You know, that, that sin has deadened our senses, and uh, that we only become truly alive 
through the work of Jesus upon the cross. Uh, and so um, this, I guess, is, if you like, the backstory to being baptised, that uh, we need to repent because we are dead in our sins. We cannot find salvation by ourselves. Uh, and it is Christ who, who makes us alive uh, in him. And then perhaps more specifically, the fact that sin is a debt that we cannot pay ourselves and that Christ has paid, excuse me, excuse me, uh, the debt for us. So there is that kind of um, the sort of kind of legal uh, terminology in scripture. Incidentally, um, the, the cross isn't only about um, paying the debt of our sin in a sort of a courtroom drama sense. The cross is also um, a spiritual victory on the battlefield over demonic powers. It's that as well. Uh, and sometimes um, theologians will emphasise more the legal aspect of sin, be, uh, sin as, as a debt being paid for. And sometimes theologians will say, well, hang on, it's not just about that. It's also about Christ winning a stunning victory over the demonic powers. Paul, in fairness, focuses on both. And actually he focuses on both within this portion of scripture. Yeah, sure. And so, you know, it, we're going up to, up to 15 now, the mm -hmm. last little point for today. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, 15 says he disarmed rulers and authorities. So actually, mm -hmm. God with that authority, I mean, we're actually pointing back up to verse 10 as well. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean to disarm the powers of these? Yes, well, I think that one of the things that arises as a result of recognising this it, is that we go into the world... Um, with hope and with confidence and without a spirit of anxiety. Um, I mean, you know, if we get it that Christ is the head of our home, we can be calm and confident and hopeful within our home. If we get it that Christ is head of the church, we can be calm and confident and hopeful in our church setting. Um, but we're, we're meant to be calm and hopeful and confident in every setting. And when you know that Christ has already, because of his work on the cross, disarmed uh, the rulers and authorities, um, that nothing is, nothing is happening um, without Christ allowing it to happen, then I think that should give us hope and it should give us uh, a sense of, you know, of, of real confidence. Um, you know, that whatever tomorrow brings, um, Christ has gone there ahead of us uh, and, and, and remains in charge. Uh, now, uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that suffering doesn't happen. Um, it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. My goodness me, the pandemic is reminding us that all, all these things do happen. But um, Christ remains on his throne. Uh, and um, uh, we must not uh, lose sight of that. Uh, it's a phrase I've used a number of times, but I think it's appropriate that God's community should be the non-anxious presence in an anxious society. Well, when we get it that um, Christ has disarmed the rulers, the rulers and authorities, that there is no name that is above the name of Jesus, then I think that does give us confidence and, uh, and hope. It doesn't mean that we're blasé. It doesn't mean that we lack compassion. It doesn't mean that we struggle. It does, sorry, it doesn't mean that, that we don't struggle with you know, the very real impact of suffering. It doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to it, but it does mean that we're, that it does mean that we're not swamped by that. And it does mean that we can bring uh, hope uh, and, and confidence. So, uh, so that I think is you know, really sort of, you know, quite an important thing to bear in mind, particularly at this time, that um, Christ is head over everything. You're right, it is back to verse 10. Um, and he has disarmed uh, the rulers and authorities. I mean, you know, elsewhere in scripture, um, Paul says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Uh, and if you have that hope and that confidence, then um, you, know, you cannot be uh, overcome by anxiety and uh, by fear. And that's, I mean, Satan is the ultimate bully. I don't know if you've had to, ever had to stand up to bullies in, in your younger days, but I've had to on a number of occasions. 
uh, and when I did, and I usually did, um, they they went away and they cowered away. Well, that's what Satan is like. Christ is in charge, full of hope, full of confidence, uh, and as we will be exploring this Sunday, before we call, God is there to help us. Before we call, He is uh, answering us. So uh, just a reminder that we have every reason to be hopeful. We have every reason to be confident. We have every reason to get up, begin a day by saying, whatever you've got, God and I and the community of faith, we can handle it. You know, and when Satan chucks loads of stuff at us, as he does, we can still say, is that the best you got? Seriously? Is that the best you got? Mm. Yeah, it's good. Mm. Cool. So, yeah, thank you, Adrian, oh, so for that. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's been good. Um, we will put some questions in at the end. Yeah, sure, and we'll, and we'll get these out there. I think the other thing is that um, there are one or two hundred leaders that are wanting these studies to come out earlier, the, the Tuesday rather than Wednesday. What we can get ahead of the game on that one, we can get ahead of the curve on that one by taking a break next week uh, sure. from it, and, and then we can, we, can, we can move that forward. As yeah. Well. So we, we can get that one sorted. Very good. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, then we'll see you. Oh, some we'll see some of you, most of you, hopefully, on uh, on Sunday. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those that want to come and are still able to come, um, it appears that they can come. Uh, but we are keeping the numbers of this Sunday to thirty, and the week on Sunday will be forty, and then on the twenty fifth we'll we'll be up to uh, we'll be up to fifty. Uh, but that's just the morning, of course. I mean, um, you know, you've got folk coming to the uh, the afternoon service as well. Yeah, the family service is going on. Yeah. And the morning service will still be streamed. Yes, it will. So we've, we've, uh, we've got a camera set up. We've got the yeah. camera, the microphone. Yes. Uh, we, we're going to have to bear with this because it's going to be a test run, really, well, first week. Yes, and, and, and all cameras make me look older than I actually am. So, you know, folk will just have to you know, put up with that, really, uh, yeah. as usual. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you on Sunday, and that's all. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. Cool beans. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cool beans. Cool beans. Did I say that? You did. Good. I echoed it.